right, here we go. Another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kudir, local realtor here in Ottawa with Sutton Ottawa. And today we are joined by Sarah Boyd from Sarah Boyd Nutrition and Fitness. Fitness and Nutrition. Fit- I stay incorrected. <laughs> Perfect. So Sarah, how are you? I'm doing well today. How are Thank you? Thank you so much for joining. Like it's been a while. I guess we've joined a few network events together and what have yep. you. And I wanted to kind of see if this is something that, you know, you'd like to come on the show and give the audience who you are, what the business is all about. And, and really just, you know, we're trying to do this thing for Ottawa. We're trying to kind of showcase that there's a lot of businesses in Ottawa. There's a lot of cool things in Ottawa to do. And it's not a boring city. And and this is kind of the, the mantra that I have for the show is trying to show that it's not. Okay, I like that. So let's get started a little bit. And what I'd like to do is I'd like you to kind of give the audience that 10,000 foot overview of Sarah Boyd, Fitness and Nutrition, okay. and go from there. Nice. Well, my name is Sarah Boyd. I work as a personal trainer part-time, but I also work as a health coach. We've all heard kind of the health and wellness coach thing. I think it's a new industry that's popping up. And really what I do is I oversee clients and in their whole aspect of their health. So taking in a holistic approach, which means looking at their nutrition, their exercise, their sleep, their social connection, their mental health, and tying it all in together toward, towards helping them achieve their goals mm-hmm. and helping them find the most efficient path uh, with the less, least amount of resistance. Least amount of resistance. You you only need the resistance when you work it out because it's always good for you. But exactly, tell me a little bit more about that resistance. Well, we have everyone has different stressors in their life, whether it comes from work or what they're eating, if they're eating foods that aren't feeling good. And so, you know, when we look at our overall stress, we have our cortisol, which is our stress hormone, and that helps us with our sleep. So it's natural that our your cortisol will raise, rise and fall with your sleep. It's also natural that with exercise, it will help that rise and fall. There's a lot of factors that contribute to that cortisol level, which is essentially we'll call it the boss of all of your other hormones. So depending on where that is, um, affects how you feel on a daily basis, affects how you're functioning, affects your you know burnout level, which we're approaching a lot these days. And so what I help to do is look at how we can help minimize that effect cortisol through different lifestyle factors, really focusing on the idea of behavior change and manipulating your cortisol via things you do have control. How important is it to keep cortisol sort of at bay? It's not necessarily keeping it at bay because when we look at our circadian rhythm, when we're sleeping, your car- cortisol does naturally need to come up in the morning in order to wake you up so you're not feeling groggy all day. But it's when we're really stressed, say with work or external factors with our family and our lives, that cortisol might not necessarily drop as it should be throughout the day. So cortisol should start coming down after you wake up. And that's why they recommend early morning exercise uh, that helps to drop that level. And so it's important that it rises and falls at the appropriate time of day. And what's the advantage of having as a human being? Kind of? I think it's the same reason I hire a realtor when I'm going to buy my house. That's a great Great answer. Really right? Like, it. I don't enjoy studying yeah. the housing market. I don't know what the best practices are. And so I look to go to a professional for that. And so it's the same thing with the health. I enjoy studying and researching health. Uh, other people don't, might not necessarily enjoy doing that, but it doesn't mean that they don't deserve to buy a house, build a house, build a happier life. And so with that, it's I bring that expert information and I combine it to their experiences and their goals. And together we go about creating that plan to move forward and to be healthier and happier. Mm-hmm. And it's sounds like you're just kind of getting into the approach of how Sarah works. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit more about that. What does that look like if I were to engage you or to work with you as a client? What are we looking at? Yeah, so the first thing it starts with is assessments. And the assessments are to really get an overall view of where, what we're looking for. A lot of people come looking for an instant fix. And, you know, we're looking in, living in a generation where we have a ton of conveniences in our life. Technology makes things really easy. Mm-hmm. And people are always looking for that easy fix, not necessarily, okay, doing the boring things on a daily basis that are going to improve our life. So what I do is evaluate the life. I evaluate where you are right now. And then we talk about where the goals are. And then from there, we set up step-by-step kind of A to Z process, not A to B because there's a million steps in between. Then go about a personalized plan to get you from where you are to where you want to be. And it's tough because people think that they can have everything. You can't have everything. You really can't, unfortunately. Now, you mentioned you're covering nutrition and fitness and um, multiple aspects of health. Tell me a little bit more about like sort of where, what's your engagement look like? What does that look like as far as, what would I expect? To work with me. Yeah, so if you were someone coming, say you had a weight loss goal that you wanted to lose weight, well, we know that in order to do that, we need to be in a caloric deficit. So if that, the only thing that needed to be approached was the nutrition and the exercise, Uh, I work in a gym, so you could come and train with me in the gym for personal training, or I also do online training where I provide the plan. That involves a little bit more discipline on people's part to do that themselves than coming into the gym where most people won't miss an appointment with someone else, but they'll always skip the appointments with themselves. And the nutrition side of things is primarily all online. I do it over the phone or over Zoom, and that's where we would 
start slowly to change a nutrition plan. The reason most fad diets fail is because it's, okay, we're going to overhaul your complete diet in one day. And then that's really stressful to make those amount of changes. So when I said earlier, we want to do it with the least amount of resistance, we're looking at changing a meal plan from someone who eats way too many carbohydrates and not enough protein, which is most people. We're going to start with increasing the protein. That's the easiest thing to focus on because if you increase your protein and you feel more full, you're less likely to overeat on other on other food things. One hundred percent. It sounds like the you're following that sort of concept, that Japanese concept of kaizen, right? Like a slow, yeah. progressive changes daily to get to. Well, that's result. what behavior changes. Yeah. You know, it takes three months to build a habit, but it takes another three months to solidify it. Mm-hmm. Most people want the instant fix, and it's just not what's going to get to that lasting change the fastest. All of the technology that we have, like uh, the Instagram reels and all of that, like snap their finger and things happen, right? Like yeah. They want that in their le- real life, but it doesn't. Like, I mean, I- I've been doing CrossFit now for about two and a half years. Just yesterday, I hit the muscle up. Okay, nice it, job. it was with a band, too. Okay. But that took two and a half years to get that just rhythm and the movement and yep. like build the muscles and get to, to that stage where I... I finally feel like I can go over the bar. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's one thing that we notice quite often, like even in real estate, like I notice it quite often where folks are just like, I want to be a millionaire. We want to be a, a full-time investor. It's just not going to happen. Like mm-hmm. you need to kind of take baby steps yep. uh, or slow little steps to get. Um, with that being said, I want to kind of understand from your approach, tell me a bit of a story about a client that you worked with and it wasn't successful and a client that you worked with and it was really successful. Okay. Tell me the difference. Okay. For a client who was successful, um, I worked with him a couple of years ago. He was young, mid to late 20s, had got the opportunity just before COVID for a huge promotion within his company. He was in the IT sector and he basically was really excited for it. And he threw himself all into it, working 60 hour weeks and within two years gained 60 pounds. And his girlfriend left him and he was struggling with ADHD. He wasn't sleeping at night and COVID had also hit at that point. And so he was feeling completely isolated, didn't know how to exercise or anything. And so in addition to coming to the gym, he was also seeing, he went to see a therapist to, to work through the ADHD and see, you know, do I need to turn to medications or are there other factors that I can, that I can work with? So he came very willing to do the hard work. He came to the gym every day. Instead of driving to the gym, he walked to the gym to get extra steps in. He was still ordering food because he was really busy and didn't enjoy cooking, but he was ordering from a local company that does healthy food and he was managing his portion sizes. And so he was coming in and not turning to that quick fix of, you know, going to a medication to treat his ADHD and starting the exercise and changing his nutrition and changing the, his sleep hygiene, which would be his morning habits and his evening habits. He was able to sleep better. And now in his case, there was a, it did end up that he went on a very low dose of a, of a medication to help him out after he had addressed everything else. But in that year that we worked together, he had lost, you know, 25 pounds, was sleeping better. And he now knew how he needed to manipulate his lifestyle factors to continue to see the change that he needed to see in his life. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And what do you sort of, like, if we want to dial it back a little bit, what do you factor or where do you relay sort of like the, the, the main factors that actually led to that success? I think it came with his willingness to do the hard things and not always constantly chasing the bright and shiny things mm-hmm. in life. You know, he was willing to do the mundane steps every single day because he knew what he was working towards and he trusted the process. And I think that comes down to working with someone that you trust and you you can relate to and having that, you know, that camaraderie between it where there's the trust that goes both yeah. ways with yeah. people. Yeah. And trust is a massive factor, like specifically speaking, when it comes to, you know, losing weight and like you're coming in, you're already sort of depressed about life mm-hmm. in this situation, as I mentioned, you know, just went through a breakup, uh, pandemic, uh, gaining 60 pounds. Like there's so many different things, right? Mm-hmm. Like you have to be able to not just willing, but like accept the fact that you're going to trust somebody with and yeah. be vulnerable in that in that sense for sure and it's really being able to take accountability and change what you can control Mm -hmm. because a lot of stuff we can't control we can't control our partner leaving us and wanting to move on you know and there's a lot of people um, that fixate on those things so another you know an unsuccessful story would be someone that came they wanted to do personal training with me and when we did the full lifestyle adjustment there were or lifestyle assessment sorry there were a lot of factors that needed to be addressed before we got to that point And so they did the work in terms of seeing professionals to, you know, deal with their injuries that they had. And we started with nutrition and sleep first. 
And, you know, we have our weekly calls and every week there were just excuses as to why something's not working. And, you know, week after week was, well, I think I need this. Okay. I reached out to people and, you know, I got resources for some mindset change podcasts and books that they could do and always giving them these resources. And after a couple of months of working with them and another excuse came up, well, I think I need to go and do this now. But you haven't done anything with nutrition. I've given you, you know, yeah. five different meal plans. And we've done a one where you're building it yourself. So you're eating the things you want. Yeah. And it was the lack of accountability between knowing that they needed to change and, you know, sitting there, this food is going to make me feel bad, but I'm going to eat it anyways. That's knowing what you need to do. But bridging that gap between knowing and doing is really difficult. And it takes discipline and it takes accountability with yourself as well into knowing that. And... So this other person just wasn't willing to do the hard work. They were looking for that magic pill. Well, the next meal plan will work. You know, it's going to be the right one. No meal plan is the is going to take the place of doing the hard work yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's the biggest thing is like y you can't work with somebody that hasn't had their sort of WTF moment. Yeah. Just yet. Mm -hmm. Or they, they think they have it, but they haven't actually really had it. Right? Yeah. Like they haven't. Like with the other example that you were giving me, the it sounds like they're they're definitely there. He yeah. had it. You yeah. Know, partner left, pandemic, gained so many, you know, so many pounds. Yeah. Like it just they hit rock bottom in a way. Yep. That they had to work their way up. Exactly. A lot of the times when, when that doesn't happen, like you said, it it just it doesn't work. You know, like you're not there yet. You're you haven't hit rock bottom to be yeah. able to say like, Well, I gotta Myself. Yeah, it really is looking deep into yourself. And I think the um, the gentleman that I worked with had had those conversations with himself. You know, he'd done the shadow work. He knew where his weaknesses were, where other people haven't had that. And they don't mm -hmm. want to do that work. They don't want to look behind the curtain and see what's really causing them to behave yeah. the way that they are. Yeah. yeah, It's one of the things like I, I still see myself with my 70 plus pounds that I had before. I'll see myself to this day. Been four years. But the reason why is because it's again, I had that moment to myself. WTF moment thinking like I'm never gonna be yeah. I'm never gonna feel like you know trying to grab something off the the floor of the car and I can't bend down and grab it yeah or looking at myself and then after a photo shoot and go oh my god who is this guy like I just sure. you get to a point where you just never want to do it again and because of that I still see myself that way mm -hmm. and, and believe it or not that's it's a mindset yes and I know I'm not that way but it's just seeing yourself kind of helps me in a way to go back and want to make sure that I'm yeah. not missing. And sure. if you do miss a week, you're like going next week double. Yeah. Well, no one's going to, and no one's going to be perfect and do no. something a hundred percent of the time. You know, sat there a couple of weeks ago, wasn't feeling good. So I went to farm boy and I'm addicted to those chocolate covered almonds they have. I don't know what it is about farm boy. They're like double roasted. They're amazing. And I sat there and I was like, Sarah, you don't need to eat this whole container. I'm sitting in my car outside the gym. We're not always perfect a hundred percent of the time. Sometimes we need to do those things, but it's also understanding that there's a cause and an effect. You know, I knew what was causing me to feel that way and I couldn't do anything about it so you know I did that I made sure I went to the gym the next day and then I moved on that was yesterday and we move on to the next day and we start yeah. over every day is a new chapter and you have the opportunity and you can make the choices every day to mm -hmm. you know to choose your own adventure is what I tell my clients all the time 100% and one of the things that I've you know one of my nutritionists that I've mentioned before and I'm, I wanted to kind of check in with you on that is it's always a 90 10 like it doesn't have to be 100% no. all the time um so you know if you're eating 90% of the time if you're eating somewhat healthy or like you know healthier mm -hmm. it shouldn't be as much of a chore because then it just becomes a habit and then exactly. you know that 90 10% that you end up off it's not really that big of a deal because you have sort of a moral compass to come back to exactly know? yep in yeah, this way very true like, not really moral uh, but yeah I get what but, you mean. <laughs> yeah i mean like it's a compass regardless exactly yeah. it's a compass in one way or another what are some of the challenges that you see building a business like this oh good question i think you know if you'd asked me this a year or two ago i would have said the pandemic and the fact you know the opens the closes and especially on the fitness industry and i don't think anyone can say that the fitness industry wasn't hit amongst one of the hardest career probably the, industries the hardest, yeah right and for a lot of us, the people who, you know, worked through it for a couple of years, it's not just the, okay, open and close. It's the, you can open, but you have to shift once again, every couple yeah. months shifting. And that's really hard to do, you know, changing what you're offering and having to keep thinking for new ways to support clients was really difficult. But the good that came out of it was the fact that, you know, people are more health conscious. People are more conscious. We had this conversation earlier. People are more conscious of who the right people are to have in their lives, who supports them and who doesn't. Joy. Exactly, who brings you joy, yeah. right? Yeah. The Marie Kondo of the relationships, you know, keeping those people close and being willing to say goodbye to the ones who don't. And so that's 
you'll see I'm a person who always finds a silver lining in things and my glass is always half full. So as much as there was a lot of challenges with that, we came out of more or less as a society, more health conscious and more willing to do some work. Mm -hmm. But I think the hard thing right now is technology and the technical revolution that we've been through in the last hundred years. We can go online and we can find 500 fad diets that all promise to help you lose 10 pounds in two days. Yeah. They could do that, but whether or not it's the right one for you, you don't know. And if your most diets will cut out one major macronutrient, which is really stressful on your body. Your brain needs carbohydrates to function. Your heart needs fat to function. Yeah. Your skeletal system needs protein to function. So if you're cutting out one of those, something's going to suffer. And so people, they can go online and they can find all of these things that promise them great results that are really shiny. And then they come to me and if they've been working with me for three weeks, it's like, well, I haven't lost weight yet. So I'm upset by it. You know, the number on the scale is the same. Well, you've lost an inch around your waist. You're sleeping better. You know, someone mentioned that your face looks slimmer. There's a lot of wins, but it's not that instant gratification. And we're a society that's constantly looking for that instant gratification and that next dopamine rush. So that's, I'd say, the biggest challenge. And in the dopamine rush, I feel like it's one of the biggest challenges that we've been seeing especially with, you know, having all those like 20 second reels and, you know, 15 second uh, TikToks and all of that. And we're, you know, we're sitting there watching like 50 of them in a row because they're just so easy to consume. And it's given us that sort of quick dopamine. Yeah. Hit. And they're designed going, that going. way. They're designed to do that. Exactly. It's no different than someone with a, you know, drug addiction or an alcohol addiction. It's yeah. exactly the same. I actually read a really great book recently. A client recommended it to me. When I do, when I start with a new client, one of the assessments that I do is called neurotyping. And so this is uh, Christian Thibodeau out of Montreal. This is his stream of thought. And um, when I first took his course, he was talking about it. And I was like, oh, that's me. I know which profile I am before I even took the test. And I've applied this to almost every single client I've used uh, since. And so when we figure out whether, you know, you function more on dopamine, adrenaline or serotonin, we can better decide what plan is going to make you feel good. So anytime you start with a new client, whether it's nutrition or sleep, it's always guesswork to figure out what plan will be the best for them to start with. And so if we find a plan that makes you feel good, you're more likely to stick to it. So what do you think or how do you guys do the assessment without necessarily knowing the client? Something like that. So I have a it's a personality assessment. It's a hundred hundred and something questions. It's pretty long. And um, it involves people being honest with themselves. And the one thing that I say is, I don't need to see your answers to the questions. I just need to see the score sheet at the end. Yeah. And so that helps people, I think, be a little bit more honest with themselves because there are some questions in there that really make you dig deep and, you know, is this how I actually am or is this how I want to be seen mm -hmm. by other people? And so with that, you know, we're gonna figure out, I'm a dopamine dominant person. I know that I'm gonna look for the dopamine rushes. My partner, he's a serotonin dominant person. So very different in terms of how we function. Dopamine dominant person can go really well on high protein, high fat diet. If you put a serotonin dominant person on a low carb diet, they're gonna be the angriest and most miserable person that you've ever interacted with. And so that's part of one of the, the assessments Science currently isn't at a point where we can measure your neurotransmitter receptors in your brain. So you have receptors that receive dopamine, adrenaline, serotonin. It helps us kind of dictate those. And with that, everyone has a different number of receptors and everyone has a different sensitivity of receptors. Yeah. So it's a personality test assessment that we use to assess it. And it's not always 100% correct, but I think it gives a great starting point. And most people are kind of a mixture of two profiles. And so with that, especially with the dopamine, where you know, we're, we are addicted to dopamine, and that's the book Dopamine Nation. And it's saying how no different than you know, our reels are designed, like you mentioned, to give us that dopamine rush. Our high sugary foods that we eat, companies that market them, yeah. they put bright colors on the boxes because seeing those bright colors release that dopamine. And we're always looking for the next feel good thing. Problem with dopamine is that whatever stimulus gave you that dopamine rush, you need more of it to get the same rush. It's an addiction no matter what it is. And so the author, and, and I you don't- need more in more quantity as well too, not just more as in like, yeah. well, I want to go back to it. No, no, it's like more and then now you got to increase the dose because it's, yeah. you're getting addicted. So you're getting actually desensitized to the amount. You know, the only, well, there's a lot of differences, but the, one of the biggest differences between, say, a drug addiction and a sugar addiction is that you're not offered drugs at every street corner. Yeah. You're offered sugar at every street corner. Every box that you look at, it's, it's all over the place, and it's so easy to consume it. So the author of this book, and I don't remember the author's name, but we can always link the, the book and the author afterwards. The solution is the pursuit of pain. So I'm reading through it, and it's not as bad as you think, where I need to put myself through daily pain. But as hard as your workouts are to learn a muscle up, made you feel good. Yeah. Right? So the receptor that takes in pleasure in our brain also takes in pain. And our bodies are always trying to maintain balance. So when we experience extreme pleasure, our brain looks for that pain to balance it out. So if you're then searching for pain and you know experiencing painful things, then you're gonna experience pleasure. 
And so I had firsthand experience with this over the winter. You know, cold plunging is really big right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I jumped on that bandwagon and it was something that I swore I would never do. And so every winter at the cottage, we're, we ring in New Year's with cold plunge. And I watch or I videotape everyone running up to hop in the shower afterwards. And this year, no one wanted to do it. And I was the one leading the charge. I found that my princess point, the line that I learned from one of my clients, it's that point at which things get uncomfortable and you start shying away and pushing away. And so over the fall and into the winter, I was realizing that this point was way closer than I wanted it. You know, I was a high performance athlete that would run across the finish line vomiting to win a race. And I don't want to be uncomfortable at all anymore. So this New Year's is like, no, we're going to cold plunge. And I'm going to lead it. And I did it. And I was only in for 11 seconds. It was terrible. And I got out and I felt like I was high afterwards. Yeah. I experienced that, ex that extreme pleasure firsthand. Then I bought a cold plunge and I started doing it three to four times a week. Nice. And it's true that I never felt that same high again from it, but I was able to stay in for three minutes. And there's a lot of not scientifically backed benefits from cold plunging. They say you'll get the anti-inflammatory and a lot of scientists will say that, you know, we can't really prove that. We're speculating on that. But I can genuinely say that the dopamine rush and the feel good rush that I get afterwards is what's motivated me to continue doing it. Yeah. It's not yeah. comfortable in it and it's uncomfortable, but. No, and then that's the other thing too. It's like there is no sort of to come out of it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's not, I'm not buying something on the street corner. Yeah. It's different. Yeah, this I believe in that, the placebo effect, Yeah, right? Even if I think it's good for me, if I feel better afterwards, that's it. Let's take it. It's great. Yeah. And the cool thing about it is at the end of the day, it teaches you a little bit of a discipline. Yeah. Which is sure. more important than anything. I know. And I had that conversation actually with a client this morning. She's like, I'm just not motivated. Motivation isn't going to be there all the time. Yeah. But what's going to take the place when the motivation isn't there is the discipline. Discipline. To know that you need to I do it. I take discipline over motivation any day. I would yep. hire a disciplined person to work for me over motivation any day. Yeah. I couldn't care less if you're motivated. Yeah. But I want to know that you've been disciplined. And one of those reasons why I, I always rely on uh, folks that are like military background or, you know, they've been working out for quite some time. There's, you're going to do it regardless of what's happening if you yeah. have the discipline. Yeah. Motivation, like you said, it's not going to be there every day. Mm -hmm. I want to dial it a little bit just around the fitness side of it. Yeah. What's your program looking like when someone comes in? Like, what's the assessment? What's the program looking like? How do you put a program together? For what sure. does that look like? Uh, it's really different for everyone depending on how they come. So once again, I start with assessments. So we'll do a movement assessment and see how they move. So we check the primal movements, how they squat, how they would deadlift or hinge if they're not deadlifting, their push movements or pull movements, basically how their body moves, where their aches and their pains are, assess any injuries. And then I always start with the posture assessment. Most people don't have great posture and that causes a lot of the pain. And so when we're looking at designing a program, the work that, you know, so say you also want to lose weight with it. When we come in for fitness, I can spend an entire hour trying to improve your posture, yet it won't necessarily give you that caloric burn that you need to lose weight. So I always design the warm-ups and the cool-downs to be around stretches and warm-ups or exercises that are going to improve that posture. And then it's a pretty generalized plan. We're going to make sure that we go full body for everybody. So a mixture of all six of their primal movements in every workout or you know a couple times per week depending on what they're doing starting with the foundation so people once again they want to come in they want to do their muscle ups right away well if you can't do a pull up you can't do good luck you know exactly you learned this firsthand if you mm -hmm. can't do a dip good luck so you have Four to start ago, with those basics i couldn't even do one pull up yeah great not even banded yeah not like even banded i couldn't even touch it and it's a lot of things combined with that, right? Exactly. You had to lose weight. You had to build up that strength. You had to build up the muscles. So we start with a foundation phase, which is basically make, getting you to move properly. And it depends for every person. It's different. Kind of between, you know, four to 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. Someone's just took a break from fitness for a while and they're coming back. It's going to be on that shorter end. They've never done anything before or they're recovering for an injury. It might be a little bit longer. Yeah. And with that, I always tell people that my goal of the foundation phase is not for you to lose weight, is not for you to gain muscle. If this is new for you, you can expect to experience those things, but it's not what I use as my measuring stick for success in this phase. From there, we go into building muscle. So looking at the movements that you're now doing correctly and making you stronger with them. I even make my 60 to 80 year olds do burpees. You know, I don't call them burpees because that I think just, you know, the mindset around that is hard. I call them down ups or if we're already on the ground, I call them up downs and they do it and they hate me. And I say, you know what, if you ever fall, you only have to get up one time. Just remember that. You just have to be able to get off the ground one time. Yeah. So relate it to their life so that they're doing it 
it's not just like Sarah's making me do this because she's, you know, wants to see me be in pain. It's no, we're going to relate this to what you need to do. You need that strength around your push up, around your squat, around your core strength in order to get yourself up off the ground. And that's the thing, like, especially for their age, right? Like if, if they are living on their own, it's difficult to know that, hey, if I got up, if, if I fell down, I'm not going to get up. Like yeah. that's that's a very sure. hard, harsh truth, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you, what are those six primal doctors? So we've got our squat. We've got our hinge, which is a deadlift motion if you're coming from a strength training background, uh, but basically loading up the hamstrings and the glutes rather than the quads. And we have our push-up, so our push motion where you're pushing away from you. We have your pull where you're pulling towards you. We have our lunge motion, which can be side lunge. There's a lot of different variations, side lunge, forward lunge, step ups, basically shifting your body weight from one leg to another when the feet are in uneven positions. And then we have our torsion control. So everyone thinks their abs are, you know, would be crunches, but it's actually more the ability to keep your spine straight and rotate around or do your movements that way. So it would be the, the torsion control that way. And then, then that's basically how you guys base your assessment on is. Yeah, we do primal. those. We, and it depending on the person coming, you know, a, an 80 year old man is going to be assessed very differently than say a 25 year old athlete recovering from an injury. Mm -hmm. So there's different assessment tools that we'll use for, you know, different abilities and ages. But at the end of the day, it's all structured the same way. Yeah. Really appreciate you coming on the show and uh, really appreciate the, the positive feedback that you bring and, and all of the information that you bring for folks out there that are watching.